Sorry. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's our pleasure to have Professor Lila Schneps from Paris, who will tell us about why the growth in the type Miller Lie algebra injects into the double shuffle Lie algebra. So this talk is going to pick up very, very directly on the talk that we just heard by Benjamin. Um, the only essential difference is that he stated the result I'm going to prove, which is that the, the group GRT injects into the group that Benjamin called DMR. So um, I think it's quite difficult to see the writing of this board, but I, I have to make a linguistic remark. DMR is a French standing for double mélange régularisé, which is double shuffle in English. And I, I actually call this DS. So I'm going to use small letters because I will be working only with Lie algebras, the Lie algebras connected to those groups. So the proof that I'm going to give today is I will define this Lie algebra, Grotendiktaichmur Lie algebra, which is connected to the group that Benjamin introduced. Uh, and the injection will be an injection between the algebra. So I'm just warning that my Lie algebra is called DX, but it's just the Lie algebra is associated to this group. So I put a couple of technical things on the board that are also in the slides, but the slides will disappear. Um, the, the, so this has resulted in now proved several times. The original and first proof, which was really surprising, was by Furusho in 2010, published in 2011 in the Annals. And then there was the work that Benjamin mentioned at the end of his talk using Delin Terosoma ideas, which I think first when Hidekazu first proved this result, we really hoped, believed, and thought maybe we could prove that these two, the algebras are isomorphic because this is the conjecture. And it just seems to be very hard and not to be reachable from this method. And then there was this hope that the second method with Delin Terasoma's original ideas were hopefully going to lead to the isomorphism of these two Lie algebras, but it looks like they, they again are giving the inclusion. And quite recently, just last year, I came up with a much, much more elementary, direct and simple proof. I'm not giving that proof today here because it's just kind of technical and it doesn't really give an in connection of mathematical objects that are interesting. In terms of the heart of why this injection is true, I still think Hidekazu's original proof is the most revealing. So that's what I'm going to give today. And mm, well, this isomorphism of these two Lie algebras that's still escaping us after, after now uh, more than 10 years. Uh, well, one started to wonder if that's, that conjecture is correct. And it could be almost correct. I mean, it's possible that they're not isomorphic, but that maybe it's double shuffle with a slight something extra that would be isomorphic or something like that. But uh, it's, it's really a strange thing that no matter what very different methods we use to approach the connection between these two Lie algebras, we always end up with the inclusion in one way and we never seem to be able to get the inclusion the other way. So the first thing I'm going to do in my talk, which I expect actually is maybe rather short, um, because I'm not going to get into the technical lemmas. I just want to show you how the proof works, like the key to the proof, and I'll tell you where the technical bits are, and, but, but some of them are basically direct calculations, so I won't actually do them. So before I do that, let me give a little quick review of what the Lie algebras are that are associated to the pro-unipotent groups that Benjamin introduced. So of course, they're going to have definitions that look very familiar, so the very first is GRT is a Gothendieck Teichmüller Lie algebra. So I've written its elements of the free Lie algebra and two generators. Um, there's two schools of notation. So the French school uses E0, E1 for the free Lie algebra and two generators. And the, where I learned it was really from the Japanese school with Ihara, who always uses X, Y for this free Lie algebra. So I, X and Y are E0, E1. It's the same thing. So you take Lie elements and, okay, I've written there a relationship which should remind you very much of the profinite pentagon defining the profinite group GT that I gave on the first day. <clears throat> but if you remember in the, in the definition of the profinite group GT, there are three relations, one, two, and three. Here you see only one. And the reason is the original definition of GRT had the same relations, linearized, of course, additive, but the same relations, one, two, and three. And um, it was quite easy to see that both in the profinite case and in the, and this Lie algebra case, the third relation actually implies the first. 
but the third relation also implies the second, so that it's not necessary anymore. And this was also a result of Hide Kaso that was done um, which year, I don't know, 2008, something like that. So we now no longer need to have three relations, but keep in mind that this is the same linearized version of the GT group with its three relations. So I'm gonna give a very quick reminder. I wrote it on the board here. I don't know if you can see anything. It looks uh, invisible to me, but the XIJs, just a reminder of what they are. So the XIJs, they generate the five strand braid group Lie algebra. And they're just, you have XIJ for all IJ going from one to five and a few relations that XIJ is equal to XJI. It's the same thing because you just, cross string, so it doesn't matter which one goes around which one. And you have some couple of very important XIJ, for any three indices IJK, you have what we call a triangle, XIJ plus XIK plus XJK. And that commutes with each one of its three terms. This is very important relation defining the Libre group. And then you have um, all the sums of all the XIJ with one fixed index is equal to zero, which kind of makes it into the sphere braid group instead of the, the plane braid group. Oh, so I just left the, the definitions there. Huh? XII is zero, thank you. Yes. You cannot um, braid one strand with itself. So the, I explained something a little bit complicated with the profinite GT the other day where I said you can't read, when you write F of AB, it has a certain meaning with a morphism and so on, but here it's much simpler than that because all of these Fs are just polynomials in X and Y, and you can literally plug in. So the pentagon is five different ways of plugging different braid variables into F, and you add them up and you have to have zero. Now, just um, I'll, I'll pick up on the reason that these, the two Lie algebras, because I'll, I'll introduce the double shuffle Lie algebra in a minute. Why are they Lie algebras? Um, basically, which was explained by Benjamin already, because he explained why the pro-unipotent groups are groups. So this is just the Lie algebra version of what he already said. And the Lie algebra version is you have a Lie bracket, the Lie bracket, I wrote it there. So for every element of Lie xy, you can, you can associate a derivation. The derivation is defined as to be zero on x, and just on y, it's just y bracket, whatever that f was. If you bracket two of these derivations, like in the last line here, this is where the bracket of F and G comes from. So it defines a certain Lie bracket on, on these elements. And to prove that it's a Lie, to prove that GT is closed under this Lie bracket is not that difficult. It's something which was done by Ihara a long time ago. Um, I think even in the 1990s when he was studying this, there was a very interesting uh, birth of the Groton de Teichmutter theory that happened in the early 1990s, which was three different people with three different things that came together. So there was Ihara who was working on these Lie algebras and stable derivation algebras and, and derivations of braid algebras on the one hand. There was Drinfeld who was working on the braided tensor categories and associativity deformations on the other hand. And there was Groton who had been a few years earlier writing his sketch of a program. And these three things were connected. So they found, they found out about each other. It may have been Ihara who told Drinfeld about Gotendik. And in any case, this... But somehow in the article by Drinfeld from 1991, he mentions the work of Ihara being re relevant. Okay, so anyway, it was the kind of the confluence of these three works together, which, which gave birth to the theory. Gotendik had indicated his two-level principle and the two-level principle implies the Pentagon but he had not actually written down or, or computed exactly what the Pentagon was and so forth. Anyway, okay, that was a little bit of history. I'm, so the fact that the GRT is really a Lie algebra under that bracket is really old. It's one of the original pieces of work that was done in this, in this area. So now I'm going to pick up the definition of the double shuffle um, Lie algebra. And obviously it's going to look very similar to what Benjamin just described about the double shuffle group. Instead of having group-like elements, now we're going to have Lie-like elements. So what does that mean? We have, just like he did, we have two generators x, y, but we have also the y algebra where we set y, i to be x to the i minus one, y. And he, this is sitting inside it. Um, and there's a free algebra on these letters, y, i. And on this sub-algebra, you have another co-product, which is different. And this is the definition of it, just as we already saw. 
And now the double shuffle Lie algebra is the space of all Lie polynomials such that an associated F star is Lie-like for the co-product. So when you have the delta of F is F tensor F, we call it group-like. And when you have that it's F tensor one plus one tensor F, we call it Lie-like. Okay, so what is this? It's just what we call a kind of correction of F. It's the F star is in an animal that you get out of F in a very simple way. First, you take your F, then you forget all the words ending in X and you just take the word ending in Y. And we were just talking about this yesterday. And then you, re when you have a word ending in Y, you can always write it in terms of the YI. So you rewrite this whole polynomial in terms of the YI. And then you just add this one little correction term. So in the group situation, this is more complicated. You have to multiply your projection by a whole multiplicative correction term. Where in the Lie situation, it's very nice because you just get this one little thing here. And in fact, if F happens to be a polynomial where it doesn't have this monomial, well, then this, this is just the correction itself, this, this, okay? Okay, so now we have the definition of the double shuffle Lie algebra and we have the same bracket as before, the same bracket for the, as, as I introduced just above. And we have the theorem that this is a Lie algebra under that bracket, but the proof is much more difficult. And I think Benjamin hit the nail on the head when he said, we know so much more about the GRT and the, the associators and the, the torsor and the things that it act on, and we can identify it as an automorphism group, and we don't have any of those things for double shuffle. We don't have any of those tools to prove that it's a group. So one just has to prove it um, essentially directly by, by calculating the bracket of things and showing that it's, it still satisfies those relations. And so there are two completely different proofs of this result. One of them is the one that Benjamin mentioned by Hassinet, which was a, uh, a big, strong technical piece of work and quite surprising, that was his thesis. And later, I think he did kind of sort of streamlined it, but it was still fundamentally the same proof. And then um, together Enriquez and Furusho showed a very nice interpretation of it. They made it much more understandable, but that was still in, I guess you could say fundamentally the same idea, even though identifying this as a stabilizer it made, uh, made it more understandable, gave a better reason for it, let's say. Uh, it can use a mold theory, and it's a completely different proof, uh, a very beautiful proof that Ecal is a French mathematician who developed a whole toolbox of tools called mold theory, which some people are in love with and other people uh, cannot, you know, are allergic to. So the world is divided into two. I think now Furusho is a convert. I'm very happy about that, though. So. Um, <laughs> If you work with molds and you, you uh, master the, the toolbox of Ecal, this, this proof becomes very easy. But the toolbox is hard. So it's not that you gain or lose. In any, it's always something, win something, lose something. Okay, but anyhow, we do know that this is a Lie algebra. And so now we get to the next bit, which is, I think in order to explain the proof, it's very important to understand uh, the, stuffel, the stuffel expression of that second condition with the co-product delta star. So this is just an equivalent reformulation of the, set of the, of the delta star condition. But it's a, it's a formulation that is going to connect us with multiple zeta values and is also going to be actually what's going to be used in the proof. So I need to introduce the stuffle product of two tuples of integers. And the, the, the stuffle product is very easy to define. It's recursively here. Um, it's a perfectly simple recursive definition. Maybe I did not write that the stuffle product of any sequence with, with the empty sequence is just the, the sequence, which is probably the first thing you need to, to use the recursion. Here's just an example. So you take your two sequences, first you shuffle them, and then you add pairs of one from this sequence and one from that sequence in, any pos in, in every possible way, pretty much, as long as you preserve the order of the two sequences. And the, where does this weird multiplication or this weird operation come from? I think we saw it just in the previous talk. If you take two multiple zeta values and you multiply them and you write them as series, uh, this is exactly what you do. You multiply them, you, you, you have a product, you have a double sum, you cut the double sum into all the shuffles, but then you have extra terms that come when the indices of the two different sums are equal. And so this funny looking operation really comes directly from the multiplication of 
of multiple zeta values written as series. Okay, now there's a little, um, there's another way of writing this, this operation here. And I put it on the board, but I don't know if you can see anything. It looks to be completely invisible, but it's just, um, Hidekazu introduced this, it's just a different notation for the same operation. The way he, and it will be used, used in the proof somewhere. That's why I put it here. The way um, that Furusho introduced uh, just a notation for the Stuffel product is, you have, for, you have these two sequences, A and B, just like there. And now you take any surjective map. So one sequence is of length R, one sequence is of length S. You take the set of integers one up to R plus S, and you map it surjectively onto one up to N, where N is anything less than, R, less than or equal to R plus S. So you take all of the, all possible maps. With all these sigmas have to verify only, that if they preserve the order of one to R and the order of R plus one to R plus S, which is just typically the thing that we see for a, sh for a shuffle. But here you're gonna define, this is an element of the stuffle. The stuffle of the two sequences is many, many sequences. It's a whole collection of sequences. And these sequences are indexed by these sigmas. And this is one sequence that will be in the stuffle. For each sigma, there's one sequence and all these together, they form the stuffle. And this is exactly what, what this particular stuffle is related to this particular sigma. So when you take all the sigmas and you write down all of these, it's another way of reformulating the same stuffle. Think of the stuffle as a collection of sequences associated to the two given sequences. And this notation with the sigma will come back in the proof. That's why I put it there. Okay, so the, there's a theorem here, which I myself have often found extremely useful, which is if you have a Lie element and you want to now see if it's in the double shuffle Lie algebra, instead of creating the correction and verifying the stuffle, you, you, in terms of calculating things and using computers and so forth, this, it's just much faster to do this. You don't worry about the correction term. You simply check your stuffle on your polynomial itself. The stuffle will never use the term sending an X. So it doesn't matter whether you project or not. The relations don't use those words. So you just keep your F. And if you avoid the sequences where both sequences are just sequences of ones, then the correction term will never play a role either. So you take, you just check all of the stuffle relations except these on your F. And if they work, your F satisfies stuffle because you, you know exactly what that correction term that you would have to add to it is to make these sequences work. It's just the term that we saw before. It's, it's this term right here. You know that there's one and only one way to adjust your polynomial so that the further stuffles will work. So this seems like a little tiny, just a little tiny result, but it's, it's very useful. So to just be able to ignore these sequences because they're very annoying, these. The correction term is, uh, one of the things that make working with a Drinfeld associator complicated. Okay, so what happened in the beginning of this subject that was like 30 years ago is that people wanted to actually, what's so wonderful about working with the Lie algebras is that you can compute because they're graded and they're just polynomials and they're polynomials of even small degree and you can actually compute them. And I remember very well when I was young, uh, in the 1990s, sometime in the 1990s, uh, when I was really working on first Descent d'Enfant for several years, and maybe two or three years, and then I was working on the Gotendieck Teichmutter Profinite for several years. And, and then Ihara came to visit France and gave a lecture. And in this lecture, he talked a little bit about the Profinite situation, and then, but he was very much interested in the, the Lie algebra situation. And he said, something which I'll never forget because it, it made a big difference to me in my, in my life. He said, when you work with the profinite groups, you're like an eagle flying high over the landscape and you see everything, but from very far away, like you don't see details. And when you're working with the Lie algebras, you're like in a very small house with a very low ceiling and you can't really stand up, but you can like look at every single thing in the room and get to know it really, really in detail. And, and like something like a light went down in my head for the first time. I said, oh, that's why. Because up till then, I'd been saying, why are they doing this? It's so weak compared to profinite. You know, it's just, you lose so much information when you go from profinite to pro unipotent. 
But then I realized you also gain so much information and you may, and you, 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 you envision these, these number theoretic connections that you can't see in the profinite, like you would never be able to see multi-zeta values if you stay in the profinite world. So then I became completely converted to <laughs> Lie algebra. So I've been having great fun with them ever since. So the, the beauty is you can compute in them, which people had been doing, um, Matsumoto had been doing, lots of people in Japan had been doing, and noticing, oops, sorry, that these, the, like the, the degree three element of GRT and the degree three element of double shuffle look very much the same, and the same as two, four, five, and seven, they were calculating more, and they were just looking the same. You could just see there's a little difference of sign. And what was noticed was this. It was noticed that this was true and dimensions were calculated up to some weight like uh, 13 or 15, not very high because it'd be hard to calculate higher than that, but the dimensions were looking equal. And so this conjecture was made that if you just send an element of GRT to change the sign of Y, that this is an isomorphism. And this conjecture has been there for a long time. And nothing happened for a long time until finally, after many years, this conjecture had been around and no one had any idea how to even, even like start because you saw the definitions of those Lie algebras, they're completely different and they come from completely different places. And uh, it just seemed a bit miraculous until finally we had this wonderful theorem that was in about 2010 that at least showed one direction. And so what I want to do is I just want to indicate the proof of the proof that Boudouchot came up with for this theorem, the, the, the original proof. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remind us a little bit about multiple polylogs. And in fact, multiple polylogs are not actually used in the proof, but I've, their duals are used. But of course, these are much more familiar than their duals. And so in, if I just showed you the duals, it would be like, what are these crazy elements? Instead, these things are very well known. So I'm just um, putting them out there so to, to put the rest of it in context. So we have these uh, single value, single not valued, single uh, variable polylogs that are defined this way. And uh, without you know, studying these deeply, maybe many of you know this already anyway, but just take a look at them because they're going to be reflected in the relation satisfied by the duals. They are numerous and uh, very symmetric and nice relations that are studied. And we're going to do, this is the beautiful trick used by Hidikazu. It's to use also the two variable multiple poly logarithms. So they're just basically the same thing, except here you, oh, oh. So this is, this is, this should be capital X and capital Y. Here we have two um, commutative variables, which are just uh, in C. So they shouldn't be used as, they should be capital letters. Later I did use capital letters. They shouldn't be confused with the small X and Y that are non-commutative. Um, I think, I guess I, I thought I had changed this, but I guess I didn't. So this, these are not to be considered the non-commutative variables. They're commutative variables, capital X, capital Y, and this is, this is your function. And it, it satisfies an analogous thing to what we just saw for the single variable polylogs, but of course, much more complicated, lots and lots of, Ah, okay, so I wrote a little note to myself. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't feel like retyping everything, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so this is just to be taken a look at because the complicated things that we're going to be seeing later are just the, basically the dual, dual, the dual reflections of these properties, and these properties are classical and well-known, very much studied. Okay, we're not actually going to use these multiple polylogs, but we, you know, we're going to use the duals, which are the same thing. And here we go. So this is what I wrote on the board there, but it's staying on the board because I, this slide is going to disappear. When you scuffle two things, you get this permutation sigma. Every, every element in the stuffle, so the stuffle is a collection of elements and you don't a priori see any sigma, but, you, but every stuffle in the collection is actually associated to a sigma like this, which is going to be useful because that sigma is going to come back. So this slide will now disappear, but stay on the board over there. But the thing to keep in mind just is that every stuffle in the stuffle set of two sequences is associated to a map sigma like this. So here's the notation. It's the same one as is on the board. You take your element of the stuffle. It's associated to some sigma map, and, and the stuffle associated to that sigma map is just denoted this way. Okay, so second trick introduced in this proof 
is that every stuffle, which is just one sequence, C1 to Cn, can be cut into pieces in a natural way. And you just choose J, well, you have to know what your sigma is. So you take your stuffle C1, Cn, you figure out what your sigma is, and then according to which is the smaller of these, uh, you know where to cut your sequence in two. And suddenly, all your stuffles in your stuffle set aren't sequences anymore, they're pairs of sequences, which is really the, the trick of this proof. In fact, it seems like such a little thing, but it's what makes the proof work. So I wrote little st of ab for the set of stuffle sequences, and I just write capital st of ab for the set of these pairs. These are in bijection. It's just that every pair has a unique way of being cut in two. And we have this formula. So this is just a major, familiar, very well-known property of the, of the multiple polylogarithms, that they satisfy the stuffle relations. But they satisfy the stuffle relations um, well, there's a, these are the double polynomials. Ah, I think maybe I, I did not write what was meant by this. Oh, I forgot to write. So sigma of x, did you remember? Sigma of xy is just xy or yx or x times y according to some property of the, of the permutation sigma, which I don't remember exactly, but in any case, this is either xy or yx or just the product xy, according to something rather with sigma, which I should have written down, but somehow managed to forget. Okay, but anyway, the fact that the multiple polylogarithms satisfy this version of stuffle relations, where here you have a pair of sequences, the capital C's are pairs of sequences. So here you have a pair of sequences and all of these are two variable multiple polylogs. This is basically going to underline the relationship between the stuffles and the, and the multiple polylogs. So now we come to this really beautiful theorem with the bar construction. Okay, that's the next slide. I'll just, so here's what happens, and it's something that is extremely remarkable. You have the braid leap algebra, which is over there on the board. It's just a braid it comes from the braid group with strands that you braid. It's very well known and familiar as a dual Lie algebra. The dual Lie algebra, well, if you think of the braid Lie algebra as the quotient of the free thing on xij's by those relations, that means the dual is going to be a, sub, a, a subspace of the free algebra on, on dual elements to the xij's. So the dual element to xij is going to be called omega ij. And the, the, the dual of the Lee P5 is going to be a subset of polynomials in these omega ij's. It's going to be a specific subset, subspace, a subspace. And I'm going to say exactly what that subspace is in, on the next slide. But before I say what that subspace is, there, this very remarkable fact that if we make this identification, so you can think of these as just elements in the dual of Lee P5, but you can also make this identification with, with differential forms, with differential one forms. And what happens is pretty remarkable. So this notation is called the bar construction. It's just a notation. This is just a word in those dual elements which live inside the free algebra on those dual elements. A word is written with these brackets and these little bars in between. I didn't invent this notation. I don't know who invented it, but, but it's just to be seen as a word. Here is, so you can take any polynomial. A polynomial means a linear combination of these words. Any polynomial, and you can ask yourself, oh, is it in the dual of my Lie algebra or not? There's a condition that says it's in the dual. And this is what that condition is. You take your, okay, so this, this is just five of the xij's. I should say um, you have 10 generators xij, but you have lots of relations, so you don't need all 10 generators. You only need five of them. And I happen to pick these five for useful reasons. You can pick lots of different ways of picking five generators, but here I've picked these five, and the other generators can all be written in terms of these five. So we really only need these five. So you pick any word, so sigma here, it's not the same as the sigma before, sorry, different sigma. You just pick any, any set of tuples, so, which is the same as picking any word like this. It's just an R tuple of these guys. And you take a polynomial 
And you ask yourself if that polynomial lies in the dual, V5 is how I denoted the dual of Li P5. And this is what the condition is. You have to take your polynomial, but in the words, you wedge, in every single word, you wedge the neighbor K with the neighbor K plus one as, as the differential forms that we saw above. And that thing has to equal zero. And this has to be true for K equals one. So you have to be able to wedge one and two and get zero or two and three and get zero, three and four. You have to, each, each pair, each successive pair, when you wedge them in all of the words in your polynomial, that has to be equal to zero. And that is exactly the, this is, this, no, this is just, this is just the thing. If you have a polynomial here that satisfies this condition, then you can make an iterated integral over the, this polynomial of, of wedged, of forms, an iterated integral over, not wedged, not wedged, just an iterated integral over these forms, and it will be independent of the homotopy class of the path. So when you're going to calculate your Li of Z, you'll take a path from zero to Z. And if you're iterating your integral over a polynomial like this, and you have this property exactly, then you're independent of anything except the homotopy class. You're independent of the choice of class in the homotopy. You depend only on the homotopy class. You don't depend on the path in the homotopy class. Right. This, con this condition exactly expresses, uh, on the one hand, the fact that your in iterated integral depends only on the homotopy class. And on the other hand, it expresses the fact that this polynomial is in the dual of the Libre algebra. So this is a very, very beautiful result that's going to play, that's playing a key role in the proof. Okay, so, oh, independent of the homotopy class. Oh, that's why, sorry. Independent of the path in the homotopy class. Uh, before I send the slides, I need to correct these things. Okay, okay. So now the dual of Libre elements are going to be living in these V5s. The, what do I call the dual of a multiple polylog? Why did I say the, the duals? Why, what did I even mean? What I meant was the multiple polylogs are iterated integrals over these polynomials in, in differential forms. And I'm going to look at just the polynomial in differential forms, not the integral of that polynomial, but just the differential forms that I'm integrating on. So when you, you have... Um, you have a polynomial in differential forms and you integrate, you get real numbers. You, well, you can, you can see that as being the dual, which is why I used the word dual for that. But what I really mean is I'm going to be looking at these elements here, which are the bar symbols over which you integrate to get the multiple poly logarithms. So first we're just doing the single, the single variable ones. So what you do, I, here I wrote Li P5 dual. It's the thing I was calling V5 on the other page, the same thing. It's the dual of the Bradley algebra. Okay, you, for a, here's your series A. For every A, you take a word A just this way, and you just replace every X by omega 1, 2, and every Y by omega 2, 3. So I just gave an example here. This is just an example. You have this whole series of, of one forms, and you do your right iterated integral of them, and you get Li A of Z of x. Okay, uh, for y it's the same, except you, you just use omega 4, 5, and 3, 4. For x, y, it's again the same, except you have this, uh, this substitution there. And now you're getting into the two variable ones, and okay, this is guy is terrible to define, but this is what it is. You don't really have any choice in the matter. When you're going to prove lemmas about this, there's going to be many different cases. It's just work, okay? But you can see that in each uh, situation, the, the two variable ones are defined recursively using the two variable ones on shorter, a shorter sequence, or one of, the, one of the sequences in the pair is shorter. So, okay, you have a different definition for all of these conditions, but basically this is the definition of this one. And then the last one we need is very easy. You do the, you do the it for x, y, and then you just uh, take a reflection of the expressions you get. Okay, so now we have five, instead of having the five mul multiple poly logarithms that we have, we have their five uh, bar, bar, bar polynomials associated to them. So a couple of examples just. Uh, if A is two one, then Y of X, Y. And this is what that, 
this is just the bar polynomial associated to this. You can check that it satisfies that condition that I said about wedging, which I just did here. You wedge these, you get zero, so that's what you need. Okay, just one or two other examples computed here, which are um, gonna be there in the notes for anybody who cares to look at them later. It's just to see that these things are really just bar polynomials of those omegas that you can actually calculate. Given your two series, you just calculate them explicitly. You can put them in a computer, which is something that I enjoy doing very much. Okay, now we, we need some ingredients for this proof. So we saw already at the very little theorem that said you don't need to look at the sequences of ones. We saw these multiple polylogarithm bar symbols. We have one more ingredient before we get to the actual theorem. I will have given you so many ingredients that the theorem, the proof of the theorem will be very short. <laughs> it's all in the ingredients. First. Actually, we have two more ingredients before we get to the, to the result. So here's a theorem. Okay, this theorem is nothing really um, because we saw it already basically. We saw that the multiple polylogarithms satisfy uh, a Stoffel relation. The only thing to note here is that when it, this was a multiple polylogarithm, here was a product of two multiple polylogarithms. Why did it become zero? It's because I am now in the dual Lie algebra and not in the Lie algebra. So the, the, if, I, if I were to be working in the universal enveloping algebra of Lie P5 and in its dual, and then these elements would, would satisfy the product, which would be the, 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 the shuffle product, exactly the way we saw with the multiple polylogarithms. But when I, when I don't work in the dual of the universal en enveloping algebra, but simply in the Lie algebra itself, I work in mod the shuffle product. So product just go away. So that's why I have a zero here. It's just because I'm in the, the Lie algebra situation. This is a definition that I should have put in the slides earlier, but didn't to say exactly what sigma uh, x, y is equal to. So I, didn't, I don't give the proof of this because this follows essentially exactly from just, we saw it for the multiple polylogs. Okay, so this is the last technical ingredient that we need. This is kind of very key, but it's also extremely beautiful. So we have a couple of little maps here. So P3 is just the map where you pull the first strand out of your five strand grade. You pull the third strand out, rather. Okay, so it has the effect of sending x12 to x and x24 to minus y, and all the x's with a three, they go to zero, and that determines your math completely. And you see that the, you, when you're going to, so you're, when you apply a bar symbol to an element of Lie P5, you get a constant. And this is what we're going to be doing because it's the dual. So when you, when you apply something in the dual to something in the Lie algebra, you get a constant. This is exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be applying these guys to, to a certain element in Lie P5. And this is showing how we're going to calculate what the result is. We're going to use these formulas to compute exactly the result that we get. So it's what this very important lemma shows is that if you, it doesn't say what you get if you apply this to a general element, but it does say what you get if you apply this to a very specific type of element. So what is the image of this? I123, I, I, J, K, it sends X to J, K and Y to K, L. Well, okay, I have three indices, J, K, L. So I said next to J, K and Y to K, L. So whenever I have a, an element in Lie P5 that just happens to be an, a, a function of two Xs, like X1, two X, two, three, that's when I'm going to be able to calculate this very easily. This guy here, whatever A and B are, applied to a Lie element in X12 and X23 is going to be zero. That's what this lemma is telling me. But this, if I have an element in X54, which is the same as X45 and X43, it's going to be zero. Here, if I have it applied to an element in X45, X51, it isn't going to be zero, but I can calculate it in the one variable situation. So this lemma is just telling me exactly how to compute the effect of these dual elements on certainly braid elements, but they're gonna be just the ones that I need. Uh, again, I have to avoid this situation just because um, you can do it, but you need a correction, and, but you don't need it because it's superfluous in fact. 
Okay, the proof of this lemma, I don't want to say it's the heart of the proof because it's not. The heart of the proof is the idea of using multiple polylogs. But technically, it's the heart of the proof. The proof of this lemma is extremely long and got loads and loads of cases. And I'm, I'm just showing you the first two proofs here just to show you that you have to calculate, calculate, calculate. And um, yeah, they get longer and longer as you go and they have many cases. The one of LAXY, we saw how many cases it has that you have to look at separately. Okay, but nothing about it is is tricky or difficult. You really, really just have to work out this entire lemma. So I, although it's technically the main part of the proof, I don't find it, I wouldn't call it the heart of the proof really. But now we can finally finish with this proof because here's what you do. So first look at this carefully because it's gonna come back, especially that. We, LA of Psi, we saw that to count, well, we saw this in the lemma. We saw that we're gonna be calculating these guys in terms of the singles but I haven't actually said what the singles are. And so I'm gonna say it now. The singles are in the dual of Li XY, and they're gonna act on a polynomial in XY and formula is very easy. You're, you have here your sequence A, and you have a word associated to your sequence A, and it's gonna give you the coefficient of the word A in whatever polynomial you're applying it to. And the only thing to notice here is that there's a little sign. Okay, so here's the proof. The proof is just a couple of slides, it's really quick. We're going to up, we have three identities here that come directly from the lemma. We apply this, this, and this, our three two variable functions to this expression here. This sum of, so psi is an element in, in, um, in GRT, psi of xy. But I put it in these two ways. I put it into Li P5, and it's now these, the sum of these is now an element of Li P5. And this guy's in the dual of Li P5, and I apply it. And I use lemma three, which told me that it's equal to this. And so I calculate that and I find that it's just this. I, now I'm going to use the same lemma to calculate this on the same elephant. So applying it to four, five, five, one, it's just four, five, one. Applying it to one, two, two, three, it's just one, two, three. And I saw what these were in the lemma. One of them was zero and the other one was this. And finally, now here's where the, here's where the main point of GRT is in double shuffle is. This one, I don't know how to calculate because it wasn't in the lemma for YX. It was in the lemma for XY, but not for YX. But I'm gonna use the Pentagon relation defining GRT. This is the place where that gets used. The, the sum of these two is gonna be the sum of these three. That's the Pentagon relation. And all of these, these were in the lemma that yx here with 432, 215, if you don't believe me, I can very quickly go back to the lemma. For yx, I had the 543, the 215, the 432, exactly those had been calculated. And so I just apply that lemma here and it's, it turns out to be just this. And so now when I have this formula and I apply, I take this element, I know it's zero, but I'm gonna apply it to, to, uh, to this, to this element here, but I know it's zero, but I have just calculated this and I know what it is. It came out to be just this for all the stuffles. Oh, I, I'm lacking a psi here, right here it should say LC of, of psi. So this is what it comes out to be, just for all the stuffles, L, LC of psi. So this is very close to showing that Psi satisfies the Stuffel. Very close, last slide. This is zero. We saw the definition of this. For if C was a tuple C1, Cn, the definition of this was this, just the coefficient of that word with the sign to the N and the word being this. So now we have this. N is just the number of Ys in, in C, or really the number of Ys in the word WC, I guess. So if we said F of XY is Psi of X minus Y, we then get this. And that's just the stuff of relation. So that proves the theorem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop here and hand the floor to Benjamin who wanted to add some compliments either to this or to the other talk as you, as you like. Well, but yeah, I... Oh, unless, yeah, maybe if there are any questions, maybe there are no questions. Let's first thank the speaker. Uh, 
Are there any questions? So uh, we, we discussed it, but in fact, um, the point is that you can, uh, so it's about this um, constru uh, construction of uh, uh, functions, uh, so you uh, ele particular elements in the uh, bar, bar complex and uh, the corresponding functions of two variables, uh, hyperlog functions. So in fact, um, my, uh, so, uh, my impression is the following. So if you uh, take a, um, a fundamental solution of KZ5, uh, so it's KZ5, so it's lived in two dimensions. And if you take such a solution, uh, then you can uh, make it, can I write on the board? Okay. I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, you can, I think your question is turning into a statement. Should, okay, I'll just remove this. So, okay, so let's write a solution DG equals uh, omega KZ G. So omega KZ is, uh, so this will be um, the KZ in M05. So M05, so if you normalize uh, with M05, you see that it's a set of XYs. Uh, such that uh, x, y are different from 0, 1, so in, the a, in a1 square, and uh, x, y uh, is different from 1, something like that, okay? And then, uh, then you have omega kz, uh, is it correct, yeah? And uh, omega kz, this is, uh, you are writing omega 1, 2, d log x, plus you have d log y, uh, d log x minus y, uh, uh, x minus one, d log uh, y minus one, and d log x y minus one. So you have five uh, differential forms and five, five dual elements, um, uh, five dual elements in the bar complex, which you call omega, I think. Uh, you call them omega, yeah? So, okay. And then uh, this is omega kz, okay? So if you uh, you can write a, a, a fundamental solution, so you have many fundamental solutions. So in uh, the work of Drinfeld, you look for fundamental solutions which are attached to asymptotic regimes. So uh, in fact, uh, such a solution is an element G uh, belongs to so U P five dual times uh, holomorphic functions on the universal cover of O M zero five. Okay. And then uh, this gives you, in particular, a map from U uh, in UP5 times this, okay? It's a tensor, uh, so uh, completely a tensor product, okay? And this gives you a map from UP5 dual to uh, this O hole, M05 chip. And my question is, so uh, is it not true that it exists, and this is just the bar complex? This bar complex. In fact, uh, this is because uh, just by linear algebra, okay, this is uh, UP5 is a, a quotient of tensor algebra by a, a degree two, uh, by an ideal of degree two, and this is uh, therefore a sub thing of the uh, shuffle algebra, okay? And so it's, uh, okay, it's exactly. And then the thing is that we are uh, looking at particular elements, so which are this A, B, and so, uh, so this pairs A, B, so that you introduced. Uh, and then you have their images that have these Li functions, Li A, Li B, or Li A, B. Okay. Okay. So, so, my, so my impression is that what you have is a description of a part of this linear map for a particular solution of this differential equation. Okay, and my question is, uh, so can you describe the full map, first of all, and, uh, and so is it true that first of all it corresponds to this, this picture is correct, that this is a part of, the, uh, a part of, of uh, such a map, uh, and the second question is, uh, if so, can you, we generalize uh, the description uh, to the whole space, and also to which particular solution do, does it correspond? So, no idea. So my, my, my question, so is it correct? Sorry. Oh, what, 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 what? The map is injective. Yeah, right. Yeah, but f first of all, my question is, so, so, so do you know which, which, 
So to which particular solution you refer to? So to which, so in fact, because you have many solutions to this, you need a... Sequence of differential forms, right? The left-hand side is just a sequence of differential forms, yeah? And uh, this map is realized by taking iterated integrations, right? Yeah. So it's important to fix the base point, right? Two, two, two. Fix a base point. That's right. And yeah. uh, my, my first question, what is yeah, your base point? Uh, asymptotic, so, which is like a tangential. So it's a tangential point. But, it, but so actually, what, it's any base point. So we have this injective. But, uh, but if uh, you change the base point, you will change the map. Hmm? Yeah, change, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. If you change the base point, they change the map. So in your case, what is the base point? Tangential base point. At which? So you have many of them. Uh, at the point zero, at origin. origin. At, at, origin, at origin, x equals zero, y equals zero. So you answer the first question. The second question is, can you describe the rest of the map, the, the fit map, in terms of the more complicated function that they what, what do you mean, the rest of the map? Because I think that you, you describe the, uh, the image, this is not the full uh, UP5 uh, dual that you are looking at here. It's not uh, even a small part of it. So it's, it's, it's a small part of it, I think. Yeah, that's... It, it, it's, it is a sense, it's, it's the rule of the Lyot, right? Hmm. It's not a small part of it, it's the big No, no, it's much smaller. No, it's the zero of the Not sure. Right, yeah. No? No, okay, the, the question. Oh. So, I, I, I'm yes. not sure at all. So, you're, you're saying the part of it that's, that's, you're saying not the part of it that's described in the conditions of what you neighbor, but the part of it that's described by LA x, y, right? Those are so all these elements, particularly okay. what you said in the dual, mm -hmm. so it's yes. LA bar is equal LA x, y. How many of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all this, this is a, a collection of dual, uh, of, of elements of the dual of UP5. It doesn't span the dual It doesn't of span, it doesn't span. No. Okay. So you miss some function. There's some function which cannot be captured. So, and is, is, there a me, is, is there a way to describe uh, the image of, uh, of a bigger part of the dual in terms of LI functions? It's possible. It's possible, possible. So one over x, x, one over x, x, y, something like that, so. Uh, 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 uh. So, okay. okay. It is still recording, okay, so, it's okay, it's okay. So, that, that's a bit too strange, so, so, okay, so, so I can see like that example. Mm. One over x, uh, x, x okay. yeah. Mm. And, and more in general, what would be the general general form? So that, that's a, that's a, so pattern is x one by x x one by x like this. Uh. But in fact, what you are doing, okay, what you are doing actually is you are putting li for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And then the thing would be one over one x and close this pattern. X over so, maybe you can insert many one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so. Yeah, okay, so this is the pattern. Yeah, so this is the pattern. Yeah, yeah. Why well, if it ends here? Mm -mm. Uh, to. There are two patterns. Mm. Oh, okay. That's a missing function, but so it's a specialization of many variable multiple polylogarithm. Mm. I see. I see. 
Mm -hmm. We will do iteration. So any number of iteration of x one of a x and then yeah, that that's a uh, iterated integral over m zero five. Mm. So we are restricting the. Mm. I'm I'm restricting only this specific case. So mm. if you consider the difference between GRT and DMO, we should ma manage these two functions. But that's so it's complicated. That's more complicated. So should I? <laughs>